What's up guys, Alexander here with Date Psychology. I'm gonna share another study with you guys today from Evolutionary Psychology. The name of this study is called Sex, Drugs, and Genes, Illuminating the Moral Condemnation of Recreational Drugs. And what this study is basically about, if I sum it up in one sentence, is the moral or evolutionary roots of opposition to recreational drugs related to sexual strategy. Kind of a run on there, but give you a general idea of what we're going to be looking at. Let me share some background with you guys first to create a foundation for the concepts that we're going to get into with this specific study. Evolutionary psychology is a field where we're looking at the evolutionary, often the genetic basis of human psychology, human behavior. So this means that evolutionary psychologists propose that moral beliefs have evolutionary origins. That would mean that moral beliefs promote self-interests, in particular sexual self-interests, in particular interests that facilitate natural selection, that facilitate maybe also sexual selection as well. Interests, when I say individual interests, these are interests that are going to be fundamentally at the end of the day related to reproduction, to mate selection, to the survival of offspring, to genetic fitness. And indeed, we see from behavioral genetics as well that many moral beliefs have a genetic background. Which ones? How much? As a general rule in behavioral genetics, there is the 50-0-50 rule. And that first 50 is how much of the variance in behavior is explained by genetics. And across many, many different things, including different aspects of morality, they tend to converge around that 50%. Some much more, some much less. The specifics, you'll have to look at very individual measures. But as a general rule in behavioral genetics, behavior, how much is explained by genetics? About 50% of the variance. We also see across cultures, across time periods, and this is a philosophical debate, but what we observe is that many moral beliefs are more or less universal right? Murder. In almost every culture, there are prohibitions against some form of unlawful killing. And I say that in a technical sense, murder, unlawful killing. Usually you can't just run over and kill your neighbor for no reason. Most cultures do have a, a form of sanctioned killing, like war as well. But murder, almost universal prohibition, perhaps even universal across time periods, across cultures. Many rules in cultures, many laws, many ethical or moral beliefs are not. They are culture specific. They are time specific, both into if it's something that is forbidden at all, as well as the degree to which it is forbidden. And one of those things is drug use. We have seen societies where no form of drug use has been prohibited. And we've seen societies, particularly modern societies, where even light recreational drug use is extremely regulated. We see very little regulations on some types of drugs, for example, alcohol, and we see very strict regulations on some types of drugs in some areas, for example, marijuana. In other areas, no. If you look at some place like California versus Singapore, you know, it's the difference between a legal drug and the death penalty. So we see a very time-specific and culture-specific set of rules, set of ethical rules, perhaps moral beliefs as well, related to drug use. But that's, that is the question here is, is are these really cultural moral beliefs or is there an evolutionary basis to these moral beliefs about drug use? Because if there is an evolutionary basis to moral beliefs about drug use, then that evolutionary basis has to be related in some way to natural selection. It has to be related in some way to the selection of mates, to reproduction, to controlling or engaging in or restricting sexuality in some way and that is what we're actually looking at in this study here, is the relationship between basically anti-drug attitudes, right? Drug condemnation and sexual strategies. So this raises a question here. Why is drug use condemned if in general, and this may be controversial to say, but I think it's typically supported, if in general drug use has relatively few externalities, it doesn't harm people directly, People with a more libertarian attitude may agree. I'm not going to have a political discussion about it, but typically looking at, at, at the evidence here. Well, evolutionary psychologists would say it's due, as I explained, to the relationship between drug use and sexual strategies. 
specifically restricted versus unrestricted sexual strategies. Or another way to look at this would be long-term versus short-term mate strategies. Now, long-term mate strategists are people that want to essentially form a long-term pair bond. They're going to be men, particularly, and this actually, these strategies apply a little bit more to men, but they apply to both. But let's talk about it in the context of men, for example. These are going to be men who want to form a longer-term pair bond with a woman. They're going to be more of a provider, for example. They're going to want to stay with that woman and help that woman raise that offspring. And from an evolutionary point of view, what does this do? It helps ensure the survival of that offspring. Conversely, let's say a short-term mate strategist. What is the male short-term mate strategy? Have sex with a woman, impregnate her, leave, have sex with another woman. And there's a lot of overlap. It's not going to be just one or another. People have, it's, I would think of it as a, as a spectrum. People can engage in both of these. And indeed, that's more in line with, with the nuance of these evolutionary theories is that people do engage in both. But those are your long-term and short-term sexual strategies. Now, the thing to understand about long-term mate strategists is that long-term mate strategists and long-term mate strategies are threatened in social ecologies that facilitate short-term mating. What does that mean? It means that, for example, if a woman is able to have more partners, if that is accepted in the society, if the social conditions of a society affect her ability to have sex with more men, to not form a longer-term relationship, that can be threatening to a long-term mate strategist who is a, a male, who is a man. So what do they do? Long-term mate strategists tend to favor social ecologies that protect long-term mate strategies. So they'll, for example, be more likely, likely to support traditional marriage, more likely to oppose drug use, more likely to oppose promiscuity or unrestricted sociosexuality, and these sorts of things. And, of course, the opposite is true for short-term mate strategists. Short-term mate strategists would be punished in these kind of environments, right? Punished for promiscuity, punished for having many partners, punished for impregnating a woman and leaving, for example, punished for going to parties where drug use is common, people are getting inebriated, and having more casual sex, right? So punished for the desire to use drugs. So we see these two things. And I mean, if you go, you take it to the, the logical conclusion, as, as some have done, a lot of political differences can be boiled down into these sexual strategies. And this is what we see in ongoing and in past research as well. Basically that drug use facilitates short-term strategies. So naturally, long-term strategists may tend to oppose drug use more. Another one that has some past research and some ongoing research as well is that abortion and birth control facilitate short-term strategies. So long-term strategists may be more likely to oppose these things. And that's kind of what we see as well in recent research that abortion restrictions are often opposed by people who would like to control uh, essentially that short-term mate strategy. They would like to control promiscuity and that sort of thing. So of course, there are many people who have religious beliefs about abortion, who have maybe philosophical beliefs, if you believe that a, a fetus or an embryo is, is a person or has a soul, but many people don't. And if they don't believe that, then you have to wonder, ah, well, that's, that's kind of strange. Why would you believe that? Well, a very good explanation for that, supported by the research, is that these are people who are basically long-term mate strategists, who, who favor that long-term mate strategy. They're disposed to it genetically, in fact. It's not even, everyone has their rationalizations for why they like their position or not, but a lot of these things are not as much of a choice as you think, guys, and we'll kind of cover that in a little bit. But basically, long-term strategists. And what I've just covered here is called the strategic interest hypothesis. Basically, that moral beliefs are rooted in individual fitness, in individual strategic interests. The past findings, for example, that would support this, and there has been a lot, and I should, I'll say it now, I'll mention it again later, but this study that we're going to look at is a replication. These are findings that have been replicated pretty well and pretty consistently. But one, for example, individuals who are more strong, men who are more physically strong, are more likely to support say unequal outcomes, or you could say more likely to oppose anti-egalitarian outcomes. They're more likely to support things like system justification or social dominance orientation, which is basically things are the way they should be when the strong rules the weak. And 
this would make sense, wouldn't it? Because men in an evolutionary environment, in a prehistorical environment, perhaps even in a modern environment to some extent, if they are physically strong, they benefit more from an unequal distribution of resources, right? Because you can just take what you want from the weaker individuals. Another example of this would be, uh, we even see it as an, as an acute effect. When people are hungrier, they tend to report more support for social welfare. Why is that? Well, perhaps they, they're hungry and they need the resource and they understand that a social system with social welfare is more likely to give them the resource. And this is something that can be observed experimentally, manipulated in an experiment to show a causal effect. Hunger causes people to support, at least in the very short term, social welfare programs. Strange, but that's the way, well, it's what, what these studies seem to show. And we can have a word about genetics at this moment. And, and that's basically that we're talking about genetics. We're talking about heritability, the passing on of one trait from fathers and mothers to the offspring. And a great deal of political, social, moral beliefs, they're genetic or heritable. We see really consistently across studies in behavioral genetics that between 30 and 70% in the variance of attitudes to these things related to short versus long-term sexual strategy, for example, abortion, gay rights, attitudes toward homosexuality are genetic, right? Whereas environment, shared environment, only counts for about 8 to 15%. I will put a study up or these studies up here that, that cover that. What we're really talking about here is called reactive heritability. And reactive heritability is the idea that behavioral traits cluster together with physical phenotypic traits. Remember, I just explained, for example, that men who are physically stronger tend to support less equal outcomes, less equal outcomes in relationships, less equal political structures, and so on. And why would that be? Because stronger men can essentially, at least maybe not in the modern environment, but historically, would be able to take what they wanted more often. They would benefit more from an unequal environment. So here we see a phenotypic trait, physical strength, that clusters together with an attitude that is beneficial to people with that phenotypic trait. So you can see that how it would be selected for. The idea here is that heritable physical traits basically underlie behavioral traits. And a lot of the time people don't even think about behavior as genetic. They realize that height is genetic and the way you look is genetic. Why would behavior or your personality or anything be any different at all? People believe in a, in a blank slate, which isn't supported by any of the genetic research in, in evolutionary psychology and evolutionary genetics and in, in behavioral genetics, of course, or just biology, whatever. It's kind of a digression here. So this is actually something, this relationship between physical strength and these anti-egalitarian beliefs that has been really, really widely replicated. Peterson and Lawson ran a series of like 12 studies across cultures, across nations all over the world, and they were able to replicate this consistently across cultures, across different measures of of what is essentially inequality or support for, for inequality and consistently found that men who are physically stronger in their upper chests were more likely to support that. Why would that be? It's got to be some ancestral relationship between stronger men basically getting more out of these, these unequal environments. So some background there. We're going to move on to this study. Let's look at the methodology and then we'll look, do the results support the hypothesis that we have just gone over? Methodology. What we're looking here at is a, a twin and a sibling study, and this is the kind of methodology that is used to determine heritability or genetic variance in traits, phenotypic traits, behavioral traits, and so on. We have a, a pretty large sample size, as these twin studies are often pretty well designed the way that they work, and they typically have very large sample sizes because they're drawn from natural, na or I should say, national registries of twins, and this one is drawn from a national registry of twins in the Netherlands. They have a sample size of 8,000, 6,000 twins, 2,000 siblings of twins. Some of these are monozygotic twins, dizygotic twins, siblings of twins. So you can see based on how much genetic material they share, how much of the traits correspond or co-vary with that genetic material. And this gives you an estimate of heritability or an estimate of how much genetics contributes to a trait. And this is controversial as well, because there is debate insofar as do these heritability estimates really tell us that it is genetic? And in this study, they report it as genetic, so that's how I'm referring to it. 
as far as this debate over heritability versus genetic contribution, complex topic, it's for another video, but that's how I'm going to report it. And that's a, a, a consistent, a standard interpretation that heritability is a accurate measure of genetics. If it really is, it's another, another debate, but I'm going to cover it as if it were. And the measures that we're looking at, we have a measure of drug use condemnation, which has items like, you see someone using some molly at a party. Is that bad or good? How bad is it? A Likert scale, you know, you rate it one through seven. Is this morally unjustified? Should this be a crime? You could look at the actual items in the study. I can't go through and list every item on every measure. It's going to take forever. But to give you a general idea, you have a measure of sociosexuality. And sociosexuality is essentially how many past partners have you had? How willing are you to have sex outside of a relationship? Do you need to be in love with someone to have sex? And it depends on the scale, which questions there are, but they all tend to correlate, right? You have inter-item correlation. So even one of these questions is going to predict these other things as well. We have a measure of sexual disgust sensitivity. And what this is, is basically, you ask a person, again, a Likert scale, how disgusted are you by this sexual act, you know? Are you... How disgusting is eating the booty? Is it is it a one? It's not disgusting. You like to do it, or is it a seven? Like you don't even want to see an ass, you know. And that's that's going to be uh, your measure of sexual disgust sensitivity. I think YouTube is never going to let me monetize a video, but whatever. That's what sexual disgust sensitivity is. And then they looked at a, a selection of personality measurements and also political measurements. And why? Because one of the things people are immediately going to ask and they're going to wonder is well, did you account for personality? Did you account for the fact that some people are culturally liberal or culturally conservative? And, and as I mentioned, these are actually highly genetic traits as well, but still, are we looking at just conservative beliefs or are we looking at liberal beliefs? Are we looking at personality differences? So they ran a big five measure, basically the big well-validated macro kind of measure of personality. They did an RWA or right-wing authoritarianism measure, which doesn't just measure extreme right-wing authoritarianism. Where people fall on that scale, act accurately predicts kind of how left or how right wing they are. Most people don't score high in that. Social dominance orientation, which also predicts left and right uh, beliefs. It predicts, as I mentioned, the physically stronger men tend to score higher in social dominance orientation as well. So it measures egalitarian versus anti-egalitarian beliefs. And they measured religiosity, a scale measuring uh, the tendency toward religious belief, right? Because religious belief can certainly contribute to what you think of recreational drug use or what you think of casual sex and so on. So these are variables that are potential confounds and it's good they included these measures to account for them. Finally, okay, so we've got the background. We've got the methodology. We can look at the results now, guys. And what we see is that the condemnation of drug use predicted sociosexuality negatively and it predicted sexual disgust sensitivity positively. These were medium correlations at point, or I should say negative point 0.32 and point 0.34. So what does that mean? People who condemned recreational drug use, low sociosexuality, right? High sexual disgust sensitivity. We see these correlations, they still exist even when we control for all of the other measures that I just went over in the methodology, the personality measures, the political measures, the religiosity measures. Control for SDO, RWA, you control for religiosity, the big five measures. Correlations are the same. So those don't explain it. Those don't explain any of, any of the difference, right? This is an independent correlation between condemnation of drug use and social sexuality and sexual disgust sensitivity. Wherever people fell on those other variables, it didn't matter. Those two variables predicted each other. I should say that one variable predicted those two dependent variables the same regardless. A couple of gender differences here. Women were more condemning of drug use, Cohen's D of 0.52, and they were more sociosexually restricted as well. So they had lower sociosexuality women. Uh, Cohen's D, so effect size 0.50 or 0.52, I should say. This is considered a medium effect size. Women also scored higher in a higher effect size here related to gender for women in sexual disgust. This was a D of 1.31, so that's actually considered a really large effect size measured by, by Cohen's D. In this study of, you know, 8,000 pairs, uh, we don't see differences for same-sex pairs, men or women, so this isn't in any of these measures, actually, which kind of surprised me. I would have intuited maybe differently on things like sexual disgust for 
for men and women who are gay or not, you know, but no, no differences for same sex pairs, no differences in same sex dizygotic or opposite sex twins either. And so what does that mean? It means basically that there's no sex differences that can be attributed to genetic or shared environmental effects, right? And as far as kind of, this is where we begin to see kind of the genetic measure, right? Correlations in the monozygotic twins who share more of their DNA for drug use, for sociosexuality, for sexual disgust sensitivity, we're all about 0.5, which again, remember the 50-0-50 rule. So we see that these three traits, boom, they fit that 50-0-50 in behavioral genetics. Correlations for dizygotic twins who share half of the genetic material of the monozygotic twins, right? They share half of the genetic contribution at correlations that remember it was previously 0.5. So now the correlations are all hanging out around 0.20 to 0.25 on those three measures. So what does this mean? Well, it suggests that there's no effect of shared environment for any of these variables. What we see instead is that the genetic contributions are very consistent based on the shared amount of genetic material. <clears throat> and so they take this and they create a model that estimates genetic variance. And what we see here is that additive genetic effects counted for about 53% of the variance in drug condemnation, about 46% of the variance in sociosexuality, and 41% of the variance in sexual disgust sensitivity. Whereas unique environmental effects, right? That's what is assumed to account for the rest of the contribution. The majority of the phenotypic covariance in these traits was accounted for by genetic effects between 62 and 76 percent, while again the remaining percent was accounted for by non-shared environments. So what we're seeing here is, is a very large contribution of genes to how much these traits correlate with one another how closely related they are, very much determined by genes, by more than half. And we can, from that, determine the genetic correlation, or how much genetics specifically correlates the two variables, and we see correlation of 0.41, so a medium to large correlation, explained by the genetics of drug condemnation and sociosexuality. And we see the same R, the same correlation size for sexual disgust, sensitivity, and drug use condemnation as well. So about 40% of the genetic underpinnings of this condemnation of drug use explains the same genetic underpinnings in sexual strategy, right? Non-shared environment in this case, which would be the home environment, for example, how parents raised the children, where did they go to school, the environment that they lived in. This only accounted for about 0.13 to 0.12, so a very small correlation, which is again what we see kind of in the 50 0 50 rule this is this is going to be something that typically accounts for a little bit less so i have mentioned in past studies the concept of replication right is this study the first study of its kind is it a one off uh is it something that if you repeat the study will be shown again has this study repeated the findings of past studies because if it's a first study and these are the first times you have seen the results you know, maybe they got it wrong, maybe it's bullshit. If it's a replication of many other studies, it tends to support the hypothesis underpinning it more. It tends to support that the results of the past studies are valid and, of course, that the results of the current study are, are going to be legit as well. And, yeah, this study is a replication of, of past findings. Past findings have also found that low sociosexuality, high sexual disgust sensitivity, etc., predicted opinions on recreational drug use, opinions on the political policy around recreational drug use. I can put up a study there. In fact, they even predicted them better than big five personality traits, which are pretty consistent predictors of political belief, of belief on drug use. But these variables predicted even better than other personality traits, which is something that you don't see often uh, when comparing variables to the big five. I'll put the study of this up on the screen if I haven't already. This is something that has been replicated as well in non-Western samples. It's been replicated cross-culturally. We see replications of the same finding in Belgium. We see it in Japan. We see it in the Netherlands. I'll put up uh, the references again here for you. And the effect sizes in all of those countries as well, the same, basically. They're the same as we see in this study. So 
not only a replication of the effect, but when you see that, ah, not, we've replicated it and we come out with the same numbers, pretty good sign that, that we're looking at something real here, right? That, that it's being done correctly and that the effect we are detecting and measuring is, is kind of accurately representing the size of the effect in the real world. So at the end of the day, kind of a summary here, what do we see, right? Our original hypothesis that condemnation of drug use is basically a sexual strategy, okay? So again, this is one new study, a replication that has, again, lended support to that hypothesis, that the reason people oppose drug use may be rooted in their own sexual strategies, basically long-term or slow life history sexual strategists. A couple of implications not directly related to the results, but just some ideas that I want you guys to think about based on this study as well as the others referenced in this video. One of those is probably that your moral beliefs and your political beliefs probably weren't as logically derived as you thought they were. And as I'm saying this to the entire audience, I don't know what your political beliefs specifically are. Maybe you're left wing or right wing or whatever, but I'm saying it, it applies to all of you. And, and why is that? Well, we often think of whatever beliefs we hold, if they're political beliefs, their moral beliefs, religious beliefs, we think of ourselves as big brain logicians, right? We have sat down rationally and we have thought really hard about it, like Ben Shapiro. We have come up with the facts and the logic and those tell us, and that's why we are right and everyone else in the world is wrong. And it's pure logic, it's pure reason coming from, you know, like Plato's logos, his world of forms into your, your brain the reality of it is probably that a large portion of your beliefs were kind of predetermined before you were born. They were given to you by your parents' genetics. The reason you're a right-wing person, the reason you're a left-wing person, the reason that you have a long or slow sexual strategy versus a fast sexual strategy, the reason that you oppose drug use versus are more libertarian on drug use, those are all things that are going to be determined at least halfway by your genetics and another halfway by non-shared environment, basically. So you probably didn't come to a lot of those conclusions in a vacuum from a blank slate, as we tend to think that we did. You may have good arguments for them, whatever your beliefs are. You, you, know, you know, they're probably not uh, totally wacko and out there because there's good arguments for all kinds of different beliefs on whatever side of, of the ideological, political, moral spectrum you are on. But those dispositions to believe those things, those were kind of with you all along. There were probably less of a choice that you, than you think, probably more emotional than you think. Something to consider there. The other thing to consider is that, again, we see a study, and that, uh, like I said, this is very consistent in behavioral genetics. We again see a study that indicates that the environment, specifically the shared or home environment, plays a much smaller role than we tend to think of in popular culture. You ask people on the street, why is so-and-so a bad person? Why did this kid turn out so fucked up? And what will they say? Oh, he probably was raised in a single parent environment. His mother was bad, you know, etc. They will look for specifically early home behaviors. And that accounts for pretty close to the zero of the variance, right? 50 genetics, zero shared home environment, 50 non-shared environment out there in the world. So what are we seeing here? The way your parents raised you, parental raising, your socioeconomic status, childhood neighborhood, those are probably accounting for very little. And of course, these are not things that were measured directly in the study, but we see it again through, through the variance distribution. And Generally, the pattern of this, again, the 50, 0, 50, we see that again pop up in another twin study, which is consistent across basically all of these, these twin studies, which is how the 50, 0, 50 rule is derived. And that's kind of a hard pill to swallow, the idea that the way your parents raised you probably doesn't change very much, right? And that a lot of your outcomes are genetic. People who believe in a blank slate or who believe very strongly in environmental effects uh, might find that hard to swallow but there you have it something to consider and finally as I mentioned I'll just mention this again before I shut the video down heritability and genetics are they the same well technically I think the answer is no 
but heritability is probably a good estimate of genetic contribution. There is a lot of debate on this. It's not something that I can go into a lot of detail right now because I'm not that familiar with the whole debate about it. So when we talk about genetic contribution, if I say this is 66% genetic contribution, what we should probably say, although the authors didn't report it that way, is that 66% heritable, right? And you can look at the limitations section in this study and they kind of explain the difference there. I've reported it the way that the authors have. And maybe in the future, we can make a video going over kind of the heritability versus the genetic debate and how much the two are actually related. The reason people do report it as genetic is because there kind of is a general consensus that these heritability estimates probably do reflect genetic contribution. The specifics of that, again, it's kind of complex, maybe for another video. Anyway, I hope that you guys learned some stuff. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll talk to you guys very soon.